Euromax highlights. Coming up on the show... Music master, British musician Peter Gabriel wins the Polar Music Prize in Stockholm. Terrific tricks, magician Nikolai Friedrich enchants his audiences with his illusions. In perfect portraits, Konrad Rufus Müller has photographed all of Germany's chancellors. Euromax highlights, and here's your host, Robin Merrill. And a very warm welcome from Berlin. We begin with an annual highlight for the horse racing fraternity here in Germany. The race is at Iffitzheim, a small town in the Black Forest. Its population of just 5,000 is swelled by thousands more racegoers from all over Europe. And it's quite a high society event as well. We met up with one of Germany's top jockeys, Andras Stager, who was hoping to be a winner once again this year. Well-heeled spectators and swift horses. International racing Baden-Baden at the Ifitzheim Racecourse is horse racing at its best. Naturally, the event also attracts the best jockeys in the business. On hand is Andras Starka, the five-time German riding champion who's come first in Ifitzheim several times before. He's odds-on favorite this year. If it's time is to horse racing, what Wimbledon is to tennis players, it's the ultimate challenge. So everyone is thrilled to compete here. And when you see how the spectators get carried away cheering us on, you realize the atmosphere is unique. Andras Starker has won 1,783 races in his career, including five victories at the German Derby. And he's won the International Jockeys Championship in Hong Kong on two occasions. But he hasn't let his success go to his head. For me, it's just very satisfying. I've made my hobby my profession, and I really love horses. And to me, there is nothing better than working with horses. It's just fantastic. Starka grew up near Hamburg. He began riding at a young age, inspired by his father, himself a former jockey. He won his first major race in 1992 at the Hoppegarten track in Berlin and experienced his international breakthrough at the age of 24 when he won the German Derby in 1998. He now has fans all over the world. He's been here more than 10 times as this is a must do on his calendar. It has been an important component of the sporting and social life of the whole of central Baden and Baden-Württemberg for 150 years. It's a very important institution and a big sporting highlight. The Ipitzheim event is not just the sporting highlight of the year here, it's also the area's biggest social gathering. Up to 75,000 horse fans visit the week-long event and place an estimated 4 million euros worth of bets in that time. I've just won the special four horse bet. I'm really pleased. I spent 12 euros. I lost the first three races, but now I've won the four horse race. I bet 50 cents, and with the winnings at 21,000, I've made 1,050, and I'll be taking that home. The unusual hats are just as big an attraction here as the horses. People come here to see and be seen. At the Lady Elegance competition, the judges choose the best hat of the season. It always makes me feel really elegant when I wear a hat. It gives me a lift. It's good for self-esteem. I love it. This is the first time that I've taken part. It was beginner's luck. I'm really pleased. It's great. The high point of the equestrian event is the contest to win Germany's most important sprint and take home the golden whip. Andras Starker is also taking part. There's 65,000 euros at stake. However, our jockey didn't take first place. I finished third in the group. I was second before that. Just one to go. Maybe he'll have more luck next time. Whether you come to take part or to have fun, international racing Baden-Baden's a winner with everyone. 
The Polar Music Prize is one of Europe's most prestigious awards and this year's winner on the popular music side is one of my favourite musicians, Peter Gabriel. Since leaving the British rock band Genesis back in 1975, he's carved a career as a unique solo artist on record with his live performances and he's pretty much outdone everyone else on the video front as well. A worthy winner of this prize. The Swedish king personally presented the Polar Music Prize to Peter Gabriel. The British musician is an illustrious company. Musicians such as Bob Dylan, Pink Floyd and Elton John have already received this award. This is an extraordinary list as you look at the Polar Prize winners. And uh, there is certainly a large voice in my head which says, how the hell did I get here? This modesty is a case of typically British understatement. From the 1970s onwards, Peter Gabriel's songs started topping the charts in Europe and the United States. And today they continue to be played by radio stations all around the world. Peter Gabriel created some of the most innovative music videos of his era and won prestigious prizes for them. The video to Sledgehammer won several awards in 1987 at the MTV Video Awards and is still the music channel's most played video. On stage, you can always rely on Peter Gabriel to put on an elaborate show with stunning costumes. I, th I think it's just being able to uh, to realize dreams is the thing that, that um, I have enjoyed and, and it, uh, so that's happened a few times and, um, and working with smart people that, that I've learned a lot from so uh, that's what I enjoy. The Polar Music Prize owes its existence to the Swedish pop group ABBA. The ABBA manager and songwriter Stieg Andersson created the award in 1989. His daughter Marie Leiden is now managing director of the foundation. Peter Gabriel is not only being rewarded for his musical creativity, but his desire to change the world. For decades, he's been fighting to improve human rights. For example, with his song, Biko, from 1980 about the murdered South African civil rights activist, Stephen Biko. In the 1980s, Peter Gabriel started becoming increasingly interested in music from all over the globe. He's the co-founder of the world music festival, WOMAD. He's also recorded songs with the Senghalese musician Yuso Ndor. For him, music is without frontiers. In Stockholm, Peter Gabriel announced the upcoming release of his new album. It will feature him trading songs with other famous musicians like Paul Simon and Lou Reed. He sings their songs, and they sing his. A new chapter in the musical history of Peter Gabriel will be opened. And the highlights continue, in my opinion, as I love magic, and Nikolai Friedrich is one of the best. He's also just been voted the world's mentalist champion at the World Championships of Magic in Beijing. A mentalist is supposedly someone who can read your mind. It's certainly someone who can convince you they're reading your mind. We caught up with Nikolai Friedrich when he recently returned here to Germany. He makes tables float, moves objects by force of will, and reads minds. Just how does he do it? Nikolai Friedrich poses puzzles for his audiences.
The great thing about magic is that on stage you manage for a moment to turn grown-ups into children. It's just wonderful when people sit there and say, wow. I really enjoy this terrific feeling of being able to give people that sense of childlike astonishment. Whether at a company party like this one in Dusseldorf, or at his shows in theaters or on television, Nikolai Friedrich prepares each move, the music and lighting with painstaking precision. That's because mentalism depends on creating the perfect illusion. As simple and casual as his tricks sometimes seem on stage, he's often taken years to develop and perfect them. A mentalist differs from an ordinary magician in that he doesn't have boxes and cases on stage and doesn't pull rabbits out of hats or saw women in half. Instead, a mentalist usually stands alone, and the audience plays the main role. That means he reads thoughts, tells people when their birthdays are. Everyone wants something, and a mentalist knows what it is. Friedrich started out with a traditional bag of tricks, making appearances in schools or small venues. He came to the attention of well-known performers such as Siegfried and Roy, David Copperfield, and Uri Gela. Then came the crowning moment of his career when he won the World Championships of Magic. He's constantly coming up with new tricks. I get inspiration from everyday life. I'd say that because people can't do magic, the source of inspiration is inexhaustible. Often I experience a moment when I think I'd love to do magic right now. And that gives me an idea for a new trick. Friedrich's magic is a mixture of insight into human nature, psychology and intuition. He's enjoyed worldwide success for more than 10 years. He no longer has to rely on his day job as a lawyer. But even though he's had a lot of practice, he's not completely immune to stage fright. I no longer get really nervous before an ordinary show. There's always a certain amount of tension and excitement because I don't have my own assistance, I use the audience. People I never had anything to do with before. But I don't get nervous anymore. If I'm dealing with new things, if I've developed something new and I'm putting it on stage for the first time, then I'm incredibly nervous. Then it's quite bad. This trick certainly doesn't make him nervous anymore. It's the one he's best known for. A piece of a Mona Lisa puzzle is missing. Her smile. From 1,500 different pieces, an audience member is supposed to pick the one that fits, guided by the magician's thoughts. Just put one hand in and take out a whole fistful of pieces, without looking, no looking. Take out a fistful of pieces and throw them in the carton. Perfect. One after the other, the woman sorts through the puzzle pieces until there's just one left. Is it the right one? Go stand by the picture, slightly behind it. Try to fit it in with your fingertips so that the audience can see if it fits. And if it does say loud, yes, it fits. It fits so well that the celebrated magician David Copperfield bought the U.S. television rights for the trick. Great stuff. I love it. To the oldest film festival in the world now in Venice. Actually, this annual festival doesn't take place on the main island where St. Mark's Square is and the canals, etc., but on the Lido, a 12-kilometer-long sandbank which helps protect the lagoon from the open sea. We took the 20-minute boat ride from the main island to join the party. The Lido is considered the lungs of Venice. Shady promenades and villas whose owners value peace and quiet. The island is 12 kilometers long and its seemingly endless beach made the Lido a fashionable seaside resort in the 19th century. The tourists here today are just everyday people. There's no sign of the annual film fever. The Venice Film Festival only happens at a few locations around town. The festival's heart beats at the Hotel Excelsior, where it began in 1932 when the industry was growing. Many stars come here. So these people who here like uh, 
We had uh, Harrison Ford going down to the beach to swim. And they just ignored him. They, they, they respect his privacy and his uh, holiday. But then when he's in black tie, he's on the passerelle, they behave like every fun in the world. So this is what the people of the Lido is. So they, they part of the event. They leave the event, but they respect it at the same time, which is very nice. Waiting outside the hotel always pays off for reporters. All of a sudden, film score composer Ennio Morricone shows up with the actors from the movie Baria, which is opening the festival this year. Francesco Schiana and Margareta Mada, as yet international unknowns. The director, Oscar winner Giuseppe Tornatore, appears relaxed. He's on his home ground here. This is where the interviews take place. A lot of stars stay at the hotel. A hundred meters from the Hotel Excelsior is the Palazzo del Cinema. There are premieres here every night, and the fans secure their places at the cordon hours beforehand. The Mostra is not a kermess. The Mostra is a place where films are judged, selected, and where people come with an orientation, and they come to discuss the choices that have been made. Behind the Palazzo is a small jetty. This is where movie stars arrive when they go to the press conferences at the casino. It's always the same ritual. Festival jury members usually stay half a kilometer away in the Hotel des Bains, where Luciano Visconti shot the movie Death in Venice, adapted from a novel by Thomas Mann. It's quiet here. There's no rushing. Everything is so relaxed in Venice. It's not all about business here. It's about movies and talking about them. Photographers at the red carpet are hunting for the best shot. It's the same as at every festival. But after the screenings and the parties, Movie stars here can withdraw to the quiet atmosphere of the Lido. People in positions of power make the most interesting subjects for the photographer. That's the opinion of Conrad Rufus Müller, who nearly always uses black and white and never retouches his prints. His speciality is portraits of German chancellors. And his pictures don't always flatter, but show the stresses and strains of the top job in politics. There's an exhibition of his chancellor photos right now here in Berlin. Photographer Konrad Rufus Müller has come closer to the powerful with his camera than anyone else. He's the only person to have taken pictures of every head of government of the Federal Republic of Germany. His newest portrait is of Angela Merkel, wrinkles and dimples included. I depicted a woman in her mid-fifties who has a very stressful occupation. I show a life lived up to the present. Till now he'd only dealt with male chancellors, Konrad Adenauer. Later, Willy Brandt. A diary of encounters with the powerful here, Helmut Kohl and Gerhard Schröder. I think it would be important to bring psychology students from every university here because they could learn so much about people they think they know because they see these people on TV every day. But there are other aspects that I try to bring out. It all began when Müller was a 25-year-old art student. He hitchhiked with his father's camera to one of Konrad Adenauer's public appearances. He wanted to photograph a face that fascinated him. I just had this old camera with no interchangeable lens, no flash. I don't ever use one on principle anyway. So I had a very inferior piece of equipment. But the picture still turned out well. Later, he traded in his father's camera for this Rolleiflex. He's still using it now, at age 69. Whatever comes out of his dark room is genuine. He doesn't touch up the images. He's been a one-man operation for 44 years. Müller has always tried to look behind the scenes of power, including in the Chancellery in the German capital, Berlin. 
He was on friendly terms with former Chancellor Gerhard Schröder, who allowed him to take photos in private situations, for example, with his wife Doris. It's a good picture because in it, Doris Schröder-Köpf looks like a shy little schoolgirl gazing in awe at a hero. Müller's work is being shown in Berlin's former post office distribution center. It's a trip back through time. Müller liked to photograph Helmut Kohl, who presided over German reunification from the back while the leader was at work. He also liked photographing Kohl's predecessor, Chancellor Helmut Schmidt. But Konrad Rufus Müller was especially impressed by Willy Brandt. This picture was taken in Norway in 1977. He was in very bad shape. Lots of alcohol, lots of emotional problems. He was cut off from power. He hadn't been chancellor for three years already. He didn't feel like Helmut Schmidt allowed him to participate. It's a very frightening photo. It's an ongoing documentation of the Federal Republic from its beginnings to the present. If Angela Merkel remains chancellor after the coming elections, the designated chancellor photographer wants to take more photos of her, more personal ones. So far, she hasn't allowed that. I can imagine accompanying Mrs. Merkel continually for a year, also experiencing her in sad and exhausted moments. If she were then to say, don't take my picture in this situation, we would soon be separated. I won't do it. I'm an artistic documentarian for my country. Which is why Konrad Rufus Müller can look the Chancellor deep in the eyes. And if you're interested in those reports and any more from Euromax, they can be found on YouTube. Just type in Deutsche Welle, English, Euromax, and the choice is yours. That's it for this edition, though. Thanks for watching, and bye-bye. <laughs>